which way will the branch bend when there's no wind left to blow? Which way will the river run when there's nowhere left to go? What do we tell the children when they start to ask us why? And where are the keepers who bled the whole thing dry? What kind of air are we to breathe when there's none to take in? What kind of soil do we turn over where to fall out spin? What do we tell the children when they start to ask us why? And where are the keepers who bled the whole thing dry? All right. It's the basic principle of this course that if you want to understand the world that you live in, you have to work really hard. And this is because, of course, the world is profoundly complicated. People have been thinking about how to explain the world for many centuries, and it is it requires tools from economics, political analysis, sociology, geology, and on and on to make sense out of it. Now, this is challenging. Because each one of these fields is difficult. Each one of these fields has a massive literature. But nevertheless, if we want to make some sense out of things, things that are in the news, things that have killed 4,000 members of your generation, things that are very, very likely to kill more of your friends, then there's no choice. You've got to understand this stuff. So today we're finishing up the economic section about the international petroleum business. To talk about this, we need to do political economy. That is, we must understand the economics of this, which requires deploying a set of basic ideas, such as derived demand, etc., the one shown in that slide, such as economic rent, and the fundamental conflict over property rights, thinking about the market structure, oligopoly with a competitive fringe, but how that market structure then interacts with the actions of large, powerful states like the United Kingdom and the United States and the countries where most of this oil has been located. By doing this, we understand some of the seeds of conflict in the region that has perhaps 60% to two-thirds of all the petroleum in the world. From the very beginning, as we've seen, there was a conflict over cash and control, a conflict over decision-making uh, processes and rents. And this conflict was intertwined from the very beginning with a simultaneous process of imperialism, this period starting in the late 19th century, well, it didn't really start then, but for our purposes, that's where we're starting it, in the late 19th century and continuing throughout the 20th century with nationalism and, as we will see in this next section of the class, other ideologies of resistance to Western encroachment. Now, so far, what we've seen in terms of this interacts and this is part of the story we want to tell. Now, we've already seen some key developments that happened in the post-war era. We know that by 1954, after the US-sponsored coup against Mohammed Mossadegh, which then restored British Petroleum and Shell to majority states in the National Iranian Oil Company, but also allowed the entrance of major US companies into Iran for the first time. We've seen that that period, 1954, can be usefully thought of as the high water mark of the corporate cartel of the Seven Sisters, one of the most successful cartels in history. They controlled well over 80% of production and refining of, ass of, of reserves and so forth, and they managed to manage the internal cartel problem rather well. 
But like any other cartel, over time, their control eroded. And we traced that erosion. We really just sketched it last time. And we know that in 1973-74, there was a revolution in cash and control in which one cartel, a cartel of sovereign states, replaced the old cartel, the corporate cartel uh, that had been before. Furthermore, there were three massive oil shocks that took place within the span of 12 years that are very important in terms of understanding the region. The first was 73-74, when the price of oil increased by 400%. The second was in 1979, when the price of oil doubled again over a much higher base to begin with, and then a reverse shock in 1986 in which the price of oil collapsed. We've also seen that for each one of these three major shocks, the decisions of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia are absolutely critical. And since the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is a sovereign state, therefore, making any sense out of, the, out of prices, even if all you're interested in, in prices in the oil business cannot be undertaken without understanding the politics of that country. We also know that political developments in the region were absolutely critical. 1973, the October War between Egypt and Syria on the one side and Israel on the other. 1978-79, the Iranian Revolution, and as we'll see, something similar was going on in 1986, basically the war between Iran and Iraq, the Saudis favoring of Iraq, as well as a variety of other political developments, as well as economic developments. So this has led to a highly unstable set of prices. You have this long period of price stability under the corporate cartel. And then shock one, shock two, erosion, shock three. So what happened next? Let's talk about the 1990s. Well, as you can see in this slide, in the 1990s, there are really two things to be said. For most of the decade, you've got relative price stability, but at a much lower price than had been the case uh, beforehand. There's one exception, there's a price spike, and that's the price spike for the first Gulf War in 1990-91, but it was just that, it was just a spike. People were afraid, remember oil's an asset price, there was a sudden increase in the price, and then it fell back down. But otherwise, relatively speaking, in his recent historical terms, prices remained pretty low. And then, in the late 1990s, the prices nearly collapsed. What happened? Simple. Demand went away. And there had been some entry, some sources of supply were still online, but it was especially driven by the Asian financial crisis of 1997, uh, which it's a long story, we don't have time to go into it here, but it was a kind of very large scale regional recession in that part of the world whose demand for oil had already been growing at the most rapid rate. This collapse led to the price of oil going all the way down to just a little under $11 a barrel. Its nadir or lowest point was in December of 1998. Now, a personal note here. In the 1990s, I went in and out. I mean, I lived in Washington for a couple of those years, and I also went back and forth quite a bit as a consultant to various agencies of the U.S. government, and in this period, there was a very popular notion in Washington that, well, because the oil prices are down, oil prices will stay down. And because oil prices are down, and oil prices are the sources of revenue for that part of the world, these regimes that we don't like, which included the Saudis, but also the Islamic Republic of Iran, they're obviously on the ropes. They're obviously going to fall apart. They're not going to be able to survive. I would keep saying, that which goes down can also go back up. And one, two, regimes don't need to be wildly popular. They just need enough revenue to get their basic core constituents of support behind them. They have enough money to do this. It's delusional to think that they're going to go away. One thing that was not noticed was that at, when the price got down to this level, there was a meeting in Riyadh in which the Saudis and the Iranians got together. Uh, and, this, and when you see the Prime Minister of Iran, Rafsan Jani was his name at the time, flying to Riyadh, you know something big is afoot. These are the two biggest players inside of OPEC councils. They were clearly going to do a deal. 
They did do a deal. They cut production by one and a half million barrels a day, which is a little over 5% of production, which doesn't sound like much unless you already know that this short-run demand function is highly inelastic, and thus you're likely to get a significant change in price. And thus, as you can see then in this slide here, prices begin to creep back up. Now, there's a blip right there in 2001, but they begin to go back up. Okay? So there is this reversal in the 1990s. Well, what happened in the last decade, the one that we just concluded? What happened in the two year 2000s? Asia weathers the financial crisis of the late 1990s, and growth resumes. Indeed, growth is faster than it had been before. We, of course, had done essentially nothing, as we've already seen when we looked at demand since the middle of the 1980s. We did nothing. SUVs boomed. We ignored energy conservation. OPEC's <coughs> spare capacity declined, whether you believe that's because of geological peak oil or whether you believe that's because of lack of investment doesn't really matter. Uh, in, in either case, that's what happened. And then, of course, we invaded Iraq in 2003. Remember, oil price is an asset price. So this invasion spooked people. They got a little nervous about what was going on. And as we will see, something like an oil price bubble emerged. This bubble popped. There was a crash. And then, subsequently, there's been a price recovery. So that's the short sketch of what's happened. Let's look at some details first decline in OPEC excess capacity. This comes from the graph comes from the Energy Information Agency and was reproduced here in a slideshow by the Kansas City Fed, showing how, yeah, their spare capacity had fallen and it looked like, you know, people always make general say, well, look, their capacity is really low, but then one year later, same graph, oops, going back up again. This has been a recurring theme in Western analyses of the international oil business ever since 1974, and that is the notion that OPEC is somehow going to go away. Maybe, but maybe not, particularly since they have so many of the world's reserves and since their governments are not run by idiots. Quite the contrary, they know perfectly well what they need to do to defend their own interests, and thus it's not apparent. Uh, that their production capacity has dwindled. And that matters, remember, because that excess capacity is what gives any actor the capability of influencing prices in the short run, which is always the goal of a cartel in the first place. So maybe the Saudis declined, but compared to other places where oil was not really being found in large quantities, where spare capacity, indeed production in the North Sea, is likely to decline soon, didn't look like <clears throat> there was going to be any reversal of OPEC's market power. Let's talk very briefly about this oil price roller coaster in the last 10 years. Here's a picture of it. This graph starts back in 1980. Here's the crash of 86. There's the Gulf War spike. There's the low point in December of 1998, just when Rasanjani flies off to, to Rio. <coughs> And then it creeps back up, and here's the American invasion of Iraq. And what happens? Up, up to here. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this, booming demand in Asia being the main one, lack of expansion of capacity elsewhere being the other, and thus prices would be expected to go up. But then we get this spike where the, where the price of oil goes way up, crashes way down, and then comes back. How do we understand this? Let's talk about this first segment first. Why did this happen? In financial economics, there's a phenomenon <coughs> called backwardization. What does this mean? It means that if you have two markets, one a market for delivery today, a spot market, and the other a market for delivery in the future, backwardization means that the price for delivery in the future is going to be lower than the price today, which means you're willing to pay a premium to get your oil right now. Typically, factorization of this kind is thought to be a kind of a signal that traders are worried about supplies. Why would they be worried about supplies? Well, with the large-scale war raging in the Gulf, launched by us, maybe they had some reasons to do this. 
Second thing that helped fuel it were macroeconomic developments, a weaker dollar, which also contributed to this. But last but not least, and probably almost certainly primary, many people think this was what's called a bubble. What's a bubble? Prices increase because people think they will increase. It's basically the lemming phenomenon. We all rush to the cliff uh, because our neighbors are rushing to the cliff. How does this work? If I think oil prices are going to go up, then if I'm a speculator, I want to buy oil and hold on to it because I think when I pay the price today, the price in three weeks will be higher than it is today. So if I buy it now, sell it later, I make money. I think this, you think that, he, she, it thinks that, everybody thinks this, everybody wants to buy, nobody wants to sell, there's less stuff on the market, prices go up, we see our expectations have been fulfilled, we therefore buy even more, and thus it feeds upon itself. Okay? The market organization of the trading for oil facilitated this. There were indexes, and this is similar to the whole financial sector that's happened in, in, the, in the last 10 years, uh, really 15, commodity indexes where people would speculate in indexes, which many of them think it contributes to instability, and 80% of these trades were being made by financial firms. Okay? So again, when you say, what's the price of oil? Remember, from the time an oil tanker leaves any port and arrives at a refinery, property rights over the oil on that boat have changed hands hundreds of times. Hundreds, because of all the trade on these organized commodity exchanges. So this drove the prices up. Expectations, concern about the war in Iraq, concern about disruption, concern about maybe it spreads to other countries, this doesn't look good, we don't like this. Furthermore, de demand is booming in Asia, you get the herd phenomenon and up go prices. But bubbles always pop. What happens? It's just the reverse of what drove them up. And that is, if what drove them up was, I think prices are going up, so I buy. You think prices are going up, so you buy. Our actions create a self-fulfilling prophecy that prices go up, so we do it some more. And then everybody does that. And we all rush off chasing higher prices, trying to buy. Then you just run, run that same movie in reverse. Prices start going down. I'm holding oil. Oh, I want to dump it. And you see this, and you want to dump it, and you dump, I dump, he, she, it dumps, everybody dumps. <laughs> Down goes the price. This phenomenon of a turning point like this has typically some kind of event that leads to this change in expectations. And the subprime mortgage lending crisis, many think, was such an event. So these financial markets, including commodity markets, since they're all integrated and people trade on all of them at the same time, you got this kind of phenomenon. This global financial meltdown impacted the oil market. Prices go back down. Then on top of it, you get a global recession. And you, that is probably the most plausible explanation for the crash of oil prices in the fall of 2008. What, what, did it, what does it look like? So by January 2007, price of oil was a little bit under $70 a barrel, which in historical real terms was quite high. Right? That's the run-up that took place because of the recovery of Asia, because of actions in a uh, decade earlier by OPEC. OPEC discipline was being maintained. Demand is booming in Asia. But then we get this speculative phenomenon, driving oil for prices for the first time above $100 a barrel, and in mid-July 2008, they hit their all-time historic high of $147 a barrel. And then, down they come. Things you know, start to unravel, the subprime crisis unfolds, the financial crisis deepens, the recession kicks in, and down comes the price. So look at this. It goes from $147 a barrel all the way down to $36 a barrel, roughly speaking. Right. A fall of over $100 a barrel. Biggest sort of quantitative change that happens. But then, notice what happens next. Prices start creeping back up. They go, as of June, they were at 69, and they stayed there this morning, according to the commodity <coughs> indexes, the price 
on the New York Exchange was 73.32. So they fluctuate around in this range, but notice there's been a kind of stability, at least temporarily, restored. So that's the story. You get this run-up in prices, a speculative spike, a speculative crash, and then we go back. If you get rid of this spike area, of this bubble zone, bubble up, bubble pop, you can see something like a kind of run-up that sort of stays like this. You can see this better by increasing the length of time, of making a, a graph for just 2009, and you can see what sort of happens. It recovers from its low point and then goes along. But now notice, if you're an energy conservation person, you know that this graph is big trouble, right? Because you know that price instability is terrible for energy conservation. Because energy conservation requires investment, it requires time, it has long lead times and there are lags, and therefore, this is a problem. Right? We know that there are lots of sources of price instability. These leads, these lags, the inelasticity, the asset price features, and this interaction and this struggle over cash and control. So this is one reason why environmental studies students have to care, or for that matter, anyone who cares about the environment, has to care about the history of international oil prices. Prices have recovered. Prices are now, again, historically speaking, relatively high. OPEC continues to be in power. Asian demand continues to surge. And whether you believe in deep oil through geology or investment, these issues have not gone away. Now, there is a second reason. If the first reason why we care, there are only three reasons. The first reason we care about all this is that we're trying to track the roots of violence in the region. And we're trying to track this complicated interaction between the most valuable resource in that region, critical to the international economy, critical for environmental considerations, with the whole process of transformation and the rise of states and so forth in the region. We also care about it, secondly, because if we're concerned about energy conservation, we have to understand this market, and we've seen that this price instability is a big problem. The third thing that we care about is that we're interested in hypotheses about the linkages, if any, between oil and violence. Now, well, we've already seen this hypothesis, right? This very simple hypothesis that sort of says, well, look, People like the former vice president knew that there was rising demand. They're, they knew, they believed in peak oil, and as a consequence of this, they decided, well, we've got to do something, and we're going to start an oil war. That's one hypothesis, very simple hypothesis. It's reasonable to say that the key institutional change in the last 40 years in this market has been the replacement of one cartel by another a replacement of a cartel of private companies, overwhelmingly British and American, with a cartel of sovereign states. So here's a second hypothesis. It's a cash and control <coughs> hypothesis. This hypothesis says that one way to think about this connection is that there was a desire, a long-term desire, ever since 1973, a desire by certain groups in Washington to break OPEC's market power. How were they going to do this? It was hard. Various ideas were broached. Indeed, even at the time, in 1974, there was a famous article written in the journal Foreign Affairs, uh, which was written under a pseudonym. The name was Miles Ignotus, which is Latin for the unknown soldier. Many people think it was actually written by Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State at the time. And it basically talked about, you know, we really should think about using U.S. military force to see some of these oil wells in the region because, you know, this cartel is really not good for us. So this is not a new idea. It's been around for a long time, and we can see it coming back again. There are in certain quarters. So there was this notion that some, in some quarters that the hypothesis is that there's this desire to break OPEC's market power. But how do you do this? Well, you can't exactly do it. I mean, one way to do it would be to say, well, we can change the government of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That's very complicated. 
As we'll see, we've long had pretty good relations with them. These relations get worse after 9-11, and there were lots of calls to do something, but still, that didn't seem very promising as a first place to start. It didn't seem very promising as a first place to start to go attack Iran, which was a functioning nation state. But Iraq, this argument continues, was different. Iraq was isolated, it had been weakened for a long period of time, and it has gigantic oil reserves. So some think one of the reasons for doing this was the idea that the United States could invade Iraq, overthrow the government of Saddam Hussein, and then somehow, magically, a government would emerge that would be willing to step outside of OPEC that would be willing to give contracts to multinational oil companies that would mimic the kinds of contracts that existed before 1973, and there would be willing to share the rents with them, would give them greater decision-making power, and consequently, the power of OPEC would be broken. Now, it's possible to argue that there were people in Washington at the time who thought like this. It's quite clear that nothing even remotely like this is what actually has happened. How come? Very simple. Complete ignorance of Iraqi history. Completely ignoring everything about what the situation on the ground was like and what was likely to happen. But again, remember, in politics, perceptions matter just as much as realities. If you can show that people thought this, at the time, then you come up with a certain kind of plausible hypothesis. A corollary to this hypothesis is advanced by Noam Chomsky more generally. This is what he calls the mafia principle, which is godfathers, folks that want to be powerful, don't tolerate successful defiance because it sends a bad message. You want to stop down defiance. You want to show others that if you defy me, you will pay an unacceptable price who have been among the most important defiers of U.S. power in recent times. Well, the hypothesis continues, OPEC will do. And not only OPEC in general, but inside of OPEC in particular, certainly Iran since the Islamic Revolution, and Iraq under Saddam Hussein. So there's a kind of combination of, well, maybe both of these things were going on at the same time. This is another example of how to think about it. Like I say, this is a hypothesis. I'm not saying this is true. What I'm saying is this is a way to try to reason your way through uh, this kind of evidence. Now, it's a problem in terms of what has actually happened, both with this fashion control hypothesis and its mafia corollary. But you know, it doesn't send much of a signal to other folks in the world about your power. If you go into a country, stomp around, and then can't really make anything happen the way you want it to happen. In fact, on the contrary, it makes you look weak. So that's not an unreasonable description of what has happened to the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan, but how, how is this explained? What did we leave out? What was ignored? What was it about that part of the world that we didn't understand? Well, we'll see for the rest of this class many things, but among them are fundamental socioeconomic forces underlying the great transformation in the region, which is where we turn now to talk about this, to talk about what was really going on in that part of the world, as opposed to what pundits inside the Beltway are saying and on the televisions, what was actually going on? What's the deeper history here that we need to understand? We know that this transformation is going on now. Okay? We have already seen that elsewhere in the world, this transformation was profoundly unsettled. We know it was very violent, so we already have a prior that probably that's going to be the same thing will be true in this region as it was in Europe. But now we want to look at just how. Just how does this work? Let's look at some of the different ways in which this transformation creates difficulties and political stresses inside of these countries. It's a feature in general that given that these processes are 
deeply rooted in things like democracy and educational systems and people's attitudes, all kinds of economic policies of governments, outsiders can sometimes have a little bit of effect at the margins, but basically outside intervention, particularly military intervention, is most unlikely to improve the situation. <coughs> the place we have to start is by talking about demography. This is an integral part of the Great Transformation, this increase in population, rising education, and increasing urbanization of populations. Indeed, that's really part of the definition of what the Great Transformation is, and these forces are, have been going on big time in the last 50 years in the region. They continue to take place now, and so we have got to make sense out of them. So here's the overview. There was a global population explosion driven by, among other things, the spread of DDT, the killing of, of malaria breeding mosquitoes throughout the global south after World War II. Today, only sub-Saharan Africa has, as a major region of the world, a faster rate of population growth than the Middle East and North Africa. From World War II to 1985, not only was there population growth, but growth, but it accelerated. In other words, the rate of population growth went up. Right? So, of course, but then, for the past several decades, many countries have be gone into something called the, de the de demographic transition, and we'll want to talk about this in a little detail to try to make sense out of these long-run demographic underpinnings of uh, change in the region. So here's a way to look at it, simple way to look at it. 1950, there were about 104 million people between Iran and Morocco. These days, it's probably around 400 million. So you've got a region of the world, and we've already been talking about the history just since World War II. Right? There's been an increase of four times the number of people in the region. This matters. And we think that, even though, as we'll see, the rate of growth is slowing down, it's going to continue to grow for various reasons, probably to around 700 million. Right? This is a big deal. I've already mentioned that. In the last 10 years, these rates of population growth have fallen sharply, but it's very different in different countries. And even if they do, if you have a big spurt of population growth, which means lots and lots of children are born, and then people a little later decide to have fewer children, that group of children that were born grow up. And when they grow up, you've got all those people who then have children. This leads to the phenomenon called demographic momentum. Uh, which then also contributes to population growth. Here, well, a lot of this data comes from the World Bank, which is a very good source of this kind of information. This shows the population over time in the region as a whole going up, and this shows the growth rate of population, peaking just at around the early 1980s and then coming down quite sharply. What's been happening? This splits it up by region of, of different parts of the region, North Africa, Western Asia, and the Arabian Peninsula, showing this kind of growth. There are different growth rates in different parts of the region. This map doesn't come from the World Bank. It comes from an open source CIA publication. It says that in this period from 2000 to 2015, by how much is the population going to increase? Well, the population of Saudi Arabia is going to be more than half as large as it was in 2000. And notice there's quite a lot of difference here. These countries in Western Asia and the Gulf seem to be going up quite quickly. Iran, much less quickly, and North Africa, the same. Now, one way to think about this is to uh, say, well, how many people is this and how fast the population growth is to think about doubling times. You may or may not know that a very simple uh, rule of thumb is called the law of 72. If you've got a growth rate for anything, whether it's your bank accounts or uh, anything at all, and you know its growth rate, what you do is take that number and divide it into 72, and the quotient gives you the approximate number of years that the base in, during which time that it'll take for the base to double. Okay? It gives you a doubling time. You can talk about this. The trouble is, is that this is a little bit like the notions about oil use. It assumes that population growth will stay the same, and we have every reason to believe that it won't. 
because this is what we know about what's been happening to population growth rates in the region. They've been coming down. So, first cut. Very large increase in population with not only the populations going up, but the rate of growth of populations rising, and then a fall. So what? Simplest and most important feature of so what is this. Most Middle Easterners are young. This is vital to understanding the region. Thanks to past and present population growth, two-thirds of everybody in the region is younger than 30 years old. 50% are younger than 20. 40% haven't even gotten to their 15th birthday. So this is a very young population. At least 40% of all adults are young adults. And this phenomenon has profound economic, social, and political consequences. Like what? Why does it matter? socioeconomic reason why it matters. If you have a very large number of young people, several things happen. You have to have a big expansion in the educational system because you've got to accommodate them. There are more and more of them every year. But that's a problem. Where do you get the resources? Where do you get the teachers? What's the quality of the education that you extend in the first place? And first, you've got to educate these people. This is a huge challenge we'll talk about. Second thing that happens is, once they get whatever education they're going to get, then they go looking for a job. Well, think about that. All of a sudden, you've got a huge number of people looking for jobs. So you have to create those jobs. So the employment, the kind of education, it also affects gender relations, as we'll see, because the rate at which men and women get educated has been different. That, that gap has been closing, but there was a gap that was opened in the last generation and something this also mattered. Another thing about this is that having a very large percentage of the population which is young doesn't only matter for reasons of economic policy, job creation, although it does matter for those reasons. You also have to find housing for this population. There are lots of socioeconomic pressures. But there are also political and ideological pressures. Because you know, I mean, think about your own life. What are you doing with your life right now? Well, you're doing many things. You're hoping to get skills. But if you have any sense at all, you're trying to figure out the world. And you're trying to figure out where you fit into it. The one way to put this psychologically is that being a young person, one of the things you are very properly doing is searching for identity and meaning. Now think about that in the region. <coughs> Huge numbers of young people, like all young people everywhere, are searching for identity and meaning, but they've got governments that, for reasons we will explore, are woefully failing to create enough jobs. They go to educational systems that have all kinds of problems, and they look around and their governments are corrupt and ineffectual not only domestically but also internationally because they can't deal with various challenges posed by various governments uh, that they don't particularly like. So this then, you would not be surprised to learn, leads young people to look for other kinds of solutions. This provides a real opportunity for political entrepreneurs who have ideas and say, look, here's a different way to do this. Look around you. This place is a mess. We have got answers about what to do, and we will see part of that. It helps to un understand the ideology of political Islam. This is part of what is going on in the region. And notice, to begin to understand this, you don't start by reading things in the religious literature, although we will look at this. But instead, you need to start with demography, something as simple and clear-cut as that. Look at this huge number of young people in the region. Okay? In the Muslim world, more generally, there is what one of my old teachers, Professor Richard Bullitt at Columbia, once called a crisis of authority. Who's in charge? Who has legitimate authority? is a big deal. This is always a political issue. But it's a political issue that is particularly acute during these phases of great stress in the, in the Great Transformation. Think about the history of Europe, for example. <coughs> was there a crisis of authority? Indeed, there was, repeatedly. All kinds of challenges uh, to this, and that's what's going on now. So here are your contemporaries in the region. You'll see they're a very diverse lot. 
They do all kinds of different things. Sometimes they walk along the, uh, along the Corniche, while on the Mediterranean in Alexandria, Egypt. And sometimes, if you make them angry enough, like in Gaza and Palestine, they do this. So, from most perspectives, we probably prefer this to that. What is it that leads from the switch from this to that? How do we understand that? That's one of the things we want to talk about. So, this phenomenon of large youth populations is not limited to the Middle East. It's a general phenomenon in the global south. The percentage proportion of youth that you find in working age population in the region peaked in 2000, but it's still pretty large, pretty high. How do we understand this? What happened? Why did the rate of growth of the population go up, and why did it go down? Let's talk, we need to talk about the demographic trans transition, which means we have to understand for the fall in mortality. We have to understand how fertility fell, but only with a lag. We have to know what the role of education was in all of this, and we have to talk about gender issues to make sense out of any of this. Okay, let's talk about this. What's the demographic transition? Apologies to 141 students who took that class last quarter. You've seen some of this before, but it, it has to be reviewed, and many people don't, may not know this. Everywhere in the world where you go through the Great Transformation, this so-called demographic transition happens. What is it? It's a combination of an initial fall in mortality followed by a fall in fertility. That generates an increase in the rate of population. In other words, that experience of the Middle East is not unique. It happens all over the world. We can see it happening repeatedly. Let's get a little more formal about this. What is this? Okay, rate of population growth, N, can in the first approximation be defined as the difference between the crude birth rate and the crude death rate. What are those rates? Okay. The crude birth rate is simply take the total number of births and divide it by the total population. Crude death rate, same thing. Total number of deaths divided by the total population. That then gives you the total rate of population growth. The simplest way to understand why population growth uh, accelerates is simple. This number goes down first. This number falls, but only later. Obviously, when this number falls faster than that number, N has to go up. Okay? So that's exactly what you can serve. Typically, demographers divide this into four phases. Here's a schematic of what happens. Phase one, both fertility and mortality are high, pre-great transformation. Phase two. Death rate falls, birth rate doesn't. Phase three, death rate continues to fall, but starts to bottom out simply because of medical technology. Most people live for a long time. And then they converge down here at the bottom. It used to be that folks did it this way, talking about it in historical phases. There are many reasons in the modern world to doubt uh, that this particular formulation. It is important to understand that the transformation in the global south looks a little different from the historical transformation in Europe. In Europe, past demographic was more gradual from lower original levels, which generated slower rates in population growth. But even there, the birth rate stayed high, population growth fell, so the rate of growth of population, even in Europe, went up initially. But here, in the global south, the death rates fell faster. It took longer for the crude birth rates to come down. Then they started from higher rates. And thus, we get, you put them together, this kind of picture, where in the uh, developed kind of the rich countries in red, the poor countries in blue, you get a kind of picture of what happens. Now, in terms of mortality, we'll come back to mortality. But the simple thing to know about mortality rates is that in large populations, Mortality rates are driven by mortality rates among the young. If you live to the age of seven, eight, or nine, and you're in a very poor country, your chances of living to be my age are not all that worse than a kid in California. So the difference in mortality rates between rich countries and poor countries is overwhelmingly driven by differences in infant mortality rates, which are defined in global statistics as between the, age, the time of birth and age one, 
And child death rates typically define either birth to five or one years old to five years old. This is where people, human beings, are most vulnerable. This is where death rates are highest. And so we'll come back to that and talk about how those change. What about fertility behavior? Presumably, we don't want to reduce population growth by increasing mortality rates. So if we want to think it could be a problem, we're concerned about fertility. But here's a problem with the crude birth rate. It's not a very helpful number. After all, it's defined as total births divided by the total population. Well, who is that population? What's in the denominator? Children, males, postmenopausal women. If we're interested in people's behavior, the behavior of those folks may have some influence, but the key behavior is behavior of women of childbearing age. That's what we need to understand social scientifically to make sense out of declines in fertility. So we want a measure that looks at the fertility behavior of women who could have children. <coughs> there is such a measure. It's called the total fertility rate. And if you want to know something about fertility behavior in countries, this, and not the crude birth rate, is the number you want to look at. What is it? It is an approximate statistical answer to this question. It approximates the answer to say, well, how many children would an average woman in Iraq or Iran or Egypt or Japan or the United States have during her lifetime? Now, of course, that's a hypothetical question. We can't know. But statistically speaking, there's a way of approximating this, coming up with a kind of answer. It's a statistical construct. It's a weighted average, weighted by share in the population, of the age-specific fertility of women of different ages. So you might start with a cohort, as it's called in demography, women from the age of 15 to 20. And you get that and say, okay, how many kids are those women having? And you then have a, you construct the fertility rate for that age cohort. Then you go to the next age cohort, which is from 20 to 25. And you do the same thing, and 25 to 30, and so forth. Okay? And that's the way you construct a total fertility rate by taking those different spe age specific fertility rates and then adding them up but giving them weights that are proportional to their share in the population. So here's an example. Here, each one of these is a specific fertility rate. Okay? The total fertility rate, here's each number one represents an age cohort. They say 15 to 20. So here we have the fertility rate for women age 15 to 20 weighted by their share in the total population. Now, there are reasons for thinking that this actually will understate, well, actually will overstate the answer that the total fertility rate gives to the question, how many children will this statistically average woman have during the course of her lifetime? It's okay as a statistical construction, but it doesn't tell you how many kids, a woman, say, age 20 in Iran, will have over the course of her lifetime if her fertility behavior is likely to be different from that of her older sisters and older cousins. Okay? And there are many reasons in terms of education why we might think this. Here are some examples of this. England's experience. And here's what two different transitions in Sweden and Mexico. Take the biggest country in the world. What happened to their demographic transition? Birth rate up here, death rate falling, then intervenes the Great Leap Forward and the famine of 1960-61. So death rates actually exceeded birth rates in China temporarily. But then the birth rate, as is typical after huge disasters, shoots up, and then it comes down fast. So that's an example of a rapid demographic transition. In India, it's been happening, but at a somewhat slower rate. But again, you can see it coming down. Okay? And notice how the total fertility rate tracks the infant mortality rate. And there are all kinds of studies about this that people, you know, it turns out that actually fewer kids dying may, helps persuade women to have fewer kids in the first place. The world is changing. This is what human fertility looked like a generation ago. What's the dark red? 4.5 total fertility rate, which means a statistically average woman would have between four and five children in the course of her lifetime. 
That's what it looked like then. Light purple is down to 2.3 to 3. And this is what it looks like today. Major changes have happened. If you look at total fertility throughout the global south, you get a picture that looks like this. You can see, so let's look at East Asia. Very rapid decline. If you look at the Middle East and North Africa, on the other hand, you see this drift down, but then the good news is some acceleration. The acceleration ends, but the downward trend continues. How is this explained? Let's talk about this. So notice that when the process starts, where is the Middle East and North Africa? Even relative to the rest of the global south, it had very high fertility. Some would argue the highest in the world, but of course there's a statistical debate about this because of the poor quality of a lot of the sub-Saharan African data. But that's the basic notion. Very on the highest fertility rates, slow, steady decline until the 1980s, and then a rapid fall, which in general, well there are exceptions, as we'll see, continues until now. How come? What drove this? Sharp falls in most countries, we can expect further falls, but remember, it's also possible that the rate of growth, of the, that the decline may slow down. And here's the key number. If you're interested in basic demography, 2.1 is your number. A fertility, total fertility rate of 2.1 is typically considered to be replacement level. Why is that? Well, because people die in accidents and various kinds of diseases, right? So just two will not give you zero population growth. 2.1 typically will. There are only a few countries in the region that are at this replacement level, okay? but most of them are not. And there are big differences in the fertility level in countries. And when you see countries with high fertility levels that already have very large youth populations, with incapable governments, and I'm talking, for example, about Yemen, which has been in the news, you can expect that there is going to be a lot of trouble. Oh, yes, there will be trouble. There is trouble now. There will be more trouble in the future. This sort of shows how it's been falling, and it varies a lot for different countries. Right? Notice some cases. Right? Here's Yemen that I just mentioned. Some change, but not a lot. The total fertility rate is still, the average Yemeni woman is still having over five kids. Okay? This guarantees a high rate of population growth. At the other end of the spectrum, that I'll talk about in much more detail in a little bit, look at Iran. Here's Iran up here in 1980. Boom, it falls to replacement level. We don't want to tell that story. How did that happen? What's going on there? We'll talk about that in just a second. Again, some selected countries, a lot of variation, a lot of changes. And over time, you get this rapid fall in some places, drifting down in others, not much change in others. How do social scientists explain these differences in fertility behavior? There are different theories. There's a kind of economic theory which uses a metaphorical structure of supply and demand, the supply of children and the demand for children. Now, it's not as exactly like you're talking about a street side market. What am I bid for little Johnny here? <laughs> We're not talking about that. Instead, the notion is a, it's a kind of a metaphor that, as we'll see, talks about uh, supply and demand. But then there's a sociological kind of theory. Let's talk about this. What's this demand for children about? It's a metaphor for desired family size. How many, if you think about it, there are going to be two things that are going to determine how many kids a family actually has. One is, well, how many kids do they want? But second, how many do they actually have depends on things like birth control technology, knowledge of birth control technology, access to birth control technology, and basic health. So one way to think about it is it could be that the number of kids that a family actually has is greater than the number of kids they actually want. If that's true, clearly birth control technology will help you a lot. There's another possibility, though. It could be that people actually want more kids than then they are, are actually able to have. How might this be? Typically, in large populations, that's because of very poor health and poor nutrition. So there are different kinds of different uh, scenarios here. Like any economic theory, 
the basic un one, a basic underlying assumption is that people's preferences don't change. Sociologists think, with some justification, that this is a little silly to talk about when you're talking about something as fundamental to your life as how many kids you have. Right? To say that your values don't change over time, come on. I mean, that's part of your basic value system about how many kids you want, things like that. They think that values also shift, and so they argue about this. One thing they don't argue about, though, is that as a general rule, the richer a country gets, the lower the total fertility rate. Now, this could just be because you have more money, but it's more likely to be that that increase in per capita income serves as a kind of proxy for much more complicated, deeper relations. In the Middle East, you get a lot of variance. There's a graph from my book that shows this kind of, if you do a, a law of regression, and this is the, with income per capita, and total fertility rate. There's a fit, but you get these outliers. Some countries have met, women have many more kids than you would expect given how rich they are, and some countries have fewer kids than you would expect given uh, how rich they are. So how do we explain that dispersal? How do we explain that kind of difference? Well, education, and especially women's <coughs> Women's education is vital in making any sense out of changes in fertility. There's also health, especially child and infant mortality, but there too, women's education turns out to be a critical determinant. There are different attempts to try to talk about this, where it comes from, health, and female education, in all cases, is rather large in terms of explaining what goes on. But to be honest about this, this is still an area of very intense research and lots of debates about exactly how to explain this. We do know that in general, the more women get educated, though typically, it's not always true, then what you get is lower, lower total fertility rates. Example from Egypt, showing the, the number at the end of the bar shows the total fertility rate, roughly the number of kids a woman has, if she has no education, if she's completed different levels of education. And it's pretty clear uh, it's a monotonic relationship in which the, when, uh, if you have less education, you have more kids. But this varies a lot by country. Here's a little graph that takes three countries and says, well, what's true in among Palestinian populations, what's true in the Egyptian population, and what's true in the Moroccan population. Well, what we can see is that in all cases, this inverse monotonic relationship between a level of education and fertility rate is true. The more education you get, the lower the fertility rate. But among Palestinians, Palestinian women who go to universities have, on average, as many kids as illiterate Moroccans. So something else is clearly going on here. And even among the illiterate, there have been some big changes, particularly in North Africa. The short answer is nobody knows why this is going on. There are hypotheses that range from everything to being constrained by poverty to, at uh, the other end, sort of cultural explanations. This whole region can watch TV from the European Union, and so values have changed as they watch sitcoms from France. I mean, there are all kinds of hypotheses out here, and nobody really knows the answer. But the good news, if you're concerned about population growth, is even among illiterate women in North Africa, popula the popula fertility rates are going down. Now, let's talk about literacy and illiteracy. Okay? This is a big deal. If we look at the Middle East and North Africa, we can see a gap okay, between illiteracy or literacy, which is obviously just a flip, okay, between men and women. Now, if you think about it, this is something that's relatively new, because historically speaking, pretty much everybody was illiterate. So what's happened is that men, young, young men, boys, tended to go to school in larger numbers than girls, at least for a while. And this created a kind of gender imbalance in education. That's the beginning of the process. But then what has happened over the last 20 years is that in many cases, indeed in most cases, that imbalance is being corrected. And so this has long-run kinds of consequences. 
It's even more interesting to look at the illiteracy of the young. Because if you take a whole population, then, of course, you've got all these older people who never got a chance to go to school. So, of course, they're illiterate. In some ways, when you look at, well, what's been changing in a society, it's even more interesting to look at, well, what's illiteracy look like among kids who might have had a chance to go to school? And the answer there is, you're getting much higher rates okay, of folks going to school and much uh, higher rates, uh, uh, much lower rates of illiteracy. It varies also with income, but huge variation. And in the region in general, there is a tendency for illiteracy to be higher than you would expect based on per capita income. And a straightforward explanation of this is that unlike increases in income that are rooted in deeper lying socioeconomic transformations, changes in the society, changes in education, creation of human capital, a lot of the income per capita as measured in this region is simply the result of oil rents. So oil rents matter. Again, not just in thinking about the corporate world, but also in terms of thinking about what's going on uh, socioeconomically. Kids have been going to school in larger and larger numbers as countries have been trying to spike this ever larger number of kids they need to put into schools, they've been trying to get them there. And here they are, here are some kids in Morocco going to school, and the average number of years of schooling has been going up. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. This has profound political implications. To anticipate, one of the reasons, there are lots of aspects to this, but one of the reasons is once you start to get some education, once you become literate, you can then read what people have to say about politics. You can start to read books and newspapers. You can begin to participate in the political conversation in your country, and this uh, may matter. It also may be the case that the kind of education you've gotten doesn't help you very much in the job market, and that may increase your frustration. So there are lots and lots of channels, as we'll see, whereby rising education uh, can play a political role. If you go to the Middle East, you will just see the place is filled with young people. Schools are crowded. They're exploding at the seams. It's a school in, uh, in uh, southern Egypt called Upper Egypt, up the Nile. Uh, they're all over the place. And everywhere in the world, you're getting more, more and more women are going to school. And sometimes they have different kinds of responses to the modern world. We have Moroccan response on the left, an Iranian response on the right, but they're both educated. They're both going to school and getting an education. This is a very useful gap, graph because it talks about by country. Take the percentage of women enrolled, the percentage of men enrolled of a given age cohort, and divide them. Are they equal? Since populations are roughly equal, it ought, the number ought to be about one. So a number of one says that the same proportion of girls are in school as in men, as are men. Notice there are some outliers like Sudan, very poor countries like Sudan and Yemen. But notice that in most countries in the world now, nearly it's nearly the same. This wasn't true in the past generation, but now it has become true. So all kinds of things are changing profoundly uh, in the region. Youth are much more likely to be literate than their, uh, than their parents. This matters, too, because it generates a generation gap. There are many sources of generation gaps, but nothing will quite do it for you like real differences in levels of education. Mom and dad just don't really get it. And so you're kind of, you know, maybe care about them and all, but, you know, they're just all these things you can't talk to them about. They just don't understand all kinds of basic things about the world, and then this has political consequences. The average number of years of schooling over time going up. Now, just to anticipate, we care hugely about this because what this suggests to me as a long-term analyst of the region is patience is essential. Be patient. This great transformation takes a long time, and it's very unsettling. But over time, 
as more and more people are educated, as the percentage of youth in the population begins to fall, as those youth have higher and higher levels of education, they are very likely to not be nearly as threatening as we Americans sometimes imagine. Now, a lot of their threat is entirely in our own minds, as we'll see. We make up all kinds of crazy stories about them. You know, we're mad, like the Cheshire Cat says. But nevertheless, it's also true that over time, you will get changes, and we'll see uh, this is another way to think about the region. If you think about it now, in most of the significant countries in the region, two-thirds of all the, all the youth can read and write. So two-thirds of all of this huge number of young people can now have access to various political writings of one kind or another. But there's persistent illiteracy in some countries, like the poor country of Yemen, which is disintegrating all kinds of difficulties, and it's already in the news. What happens to death rates? So that's the story about fertility. Right? And it matters, not just from the point of view of human development, not just from an economic development point of view, but also from a political point of view. What about infant and child mortality? Huge falls. We care about this for its own sake. I've never met anyone who thinks that more dead children is better than fewer. It also has an effect of reducing fertility. What determines it? Something called a GOBI and female education. What's GOBI? Growth charts, simple things. Why do people in the United States, why do young mothers take their kids in to have them measured at very regular intervals? Because we have a huge amount of statistics about how fast kids should grow, and of course there's a statistical interval there. But if the kid suddenly is way below the, the sort of the band, that's a signal to the doctor of, whoa, trouble, something's wrong here, we gotta do something. Lots of times people don't know. So if they're not doing this, nothing happens. But notice, the mother, first of all, those rural, there have to be health clinics where the mother can go in the first place. She has to be able to afford to go there. And uh, there has, she has to know that this is something to do. Oral rehydration therapy, really simple. You may know about this. Five cents a packet saves a kid's life because when kids get dysentery, they basically lose all their fluids and they can die. Breastfeeding, nothing quite like human milk for human primates. Pretty surprising how evolution works, huh? Right? Uh, pretty obvious, uh, but that's true. that's true. And immunization, basic things. Notice, for all of those things to take place, you've got to have one, some kind of health system that reaches most people, and two, the women have to know about it. They have to be aware of it, and so it matters. All over the world, we've gotten declines in infant mortality, okay? everywhere in the world. A lot of things have been going on in the world that aren't very nice. Lots of ugly stuff out there. Lots of problems of global climate change. Lots of wars. But here's something globally that's very good news. A whole lot fewer children are dying than used to be. Many fewer children are dying now than were dying when I was sitting where you are in lecture halls at, at, at university. This is a good thing. This is a great accomplishment. It's related to income, but again, you have got to get a lot of variation. And it's still the case that in the Middle East and North Africa, compared to places like the advanced industrial countries, the rich countries, okay, typically these are numbers given in five numbers per thousand births. So on average, about five kids die per thousand births in rich countries, but 45, nine times as many, die in the Middle East and North Africa. So although there's been a lot of progress, there still is some way to go. Infant mortality rates have been coming down, but that's hard to do, particularly in countries that are poor and in countries where people live out in the countryside. You gotta find ways to reach out and get healthcare out into those areas, and that's difficult. Lifetime risk of a mother dying in childbirth, you can see it's very small, happily, in rich countries. It's a lot higher in the Middle East and North Africa, much less other parts of the world. So that's the good news. But it's also true that things can go wrong. Mortality, infant mortality, can go back up. Fertility can also go back up, although both of these, happily, 
or unusual phenomenon. One exception, though, which is, statistically speaking, unusual, but that we care about a lot, is the case of Iraq. What happened to infant mortality in Iraq during the 1990s? Most Americans know next to nothing about this. Most Iraqis know all about it, and most Arabs throughout the Arab world, thanks to rising education and communications, know all about this. What are we talking about? This is a very anomalous case, as we've seen everywhere in the world. You take those graphs in mortality, they all go down. Pick a, pick a region, any region, they all go down. Pick a country, any country, overwhelmingly, they go down. In the U.S., this was true in Iraq until 1991. It was the usual case. Starts from very high levels of infant mortality, and it's, it's coming down. And then, there was a war. Several things happened. First... During Operation Desert Storm, the United States Air Force extensively bombed the infrastructure, including water purification plants. We already know that one of the big killers of kids is contaminated water, so this is a problem, particularly if you can't then put those plants back together. Because of a sanctions regime imposed by the United Nations, concerned about Saddam's access to, new, uh, to weapons of mass destruction, and we'll talk about that, that led to some difficulties. Saddam's regime, to put it mildly, was not helpful here. And the aftermath was a historically unprecedented rise in child mortality. What did Operation Desert Storm do? It knocked out 92%, 90%, let's round it off, of electrical power generated capacity. Remember, this is a country where the temperatures in the summer go to 120 Fahrenheit routinely. It's really hot in Iraq in the summer. So, hmm, get rid of electricity, get rid of air conditioning, get rid of clean water. You know, very lots of heat with stagnant water is really a pathogen's paradise, right? As any microbiologist will tell you. Knocked out their oil refining capacity, bomb dams, four out of seven major water pumping stations, 31 water and sewerage facilities, water purification plant. We basically blew the place up. Okay? We did this on purpose. This was not collateral damage. This was part of the plan. This is quite clear. The idea was to cripple Iraqi power and intentionally destroy these kinds of things. Lots of countries get destroyed by bombing during wars. Typically after the war, if there's been a lot of bombing, then they rebuild what was bombed. But that didn't happen in Iraq because of something called the sanction regime. Trying to get Saddam, who was not complying with various UN Security Council resolutions on Kuwait, economic sanctions were imposed on him. Now, we now know that one of the ironies is that he actually did comply with the, with the Security Council resolutions on weapons of mass destruction. He actually did destroy them. He just didn't admit it. And we think, well, why didn't he admit it? Well, because he wasn't afraid of the United States. He was afraid of the Iranians. And so he said, well, I'm going to pretend that I still got this because maybe that'll be these guys that I just fought this long war, uh, another war in the 1980s against. Maybe that'll keep them at bay. Uh, it was a pretty dumb strategy, but that was the strategy he adopted. And as a result, the UN Security Council, under American leadership, imposed very, very severe economic sanctions in the country. These covered every commodity that was thought to be of war-making potential. Well, take, what's an example? Well, take chlorine. Okay. You can take chlorine, and you can use chlorine to make chlorine gas, which is a weapon of mass destruction. It's a chemical weapon. But, of course, you also use chlorine to purify water. So if you keep chlorine out, then you make it harder to purify water, and so you have more difficulties. This further undermined public health nutrition educational systems and created this kind of mess. If kids drink dirty water, they get sick. They get really sick, and lots of the time they die. And so what did this mean statistically? It meant this. It meant if you look at Iraqi infant mortality, it's going down. Under five mortality, it's going down. All very normal down to here. Then along comes the war, and up it goes, and up it stays. So you get this rebound. Okay. In mortality, flip it around and just talk about the probability of a child surviving. The probability of a child surviving is going up and then it goes back down. These were the sanctions. Okay. 
There's an article in Foreign Affairs magazine published several years ago. And the title is The Sanctions Work. And what does this mean? It means they prevented Saddam Hussein from reconstituting his weapons of mass destruction program, which was their design, and they succeeded in doing this. The costs to Iraqi children, on the other hand, were widely known and absolutely infuriated Arab opinion and indeed Muslim opinion and lots of other people's opinion throughout the world. It did little to make the United States look good. And there were some people who protested, and they weren't exactly hippies. Here's Dennis Halliday. He was appointed United Nations Humanitarian Coordinator in Baghdad. He was an Irish diplomat. He resigned after 13 months. What did he say? He said, we're in the process of destroying an entire society. It's as simple and terrifying as that. It is illegal and immoral. Irish diplomat. Second protester, his successor, Count Hans von Spomack, took over from Halliday, German. Okay? He resigned 18 months later. What did he have to say? He thought he was being misused. Okay? Now, suppose you wanted to answer a question, a really macabre question. How many kids were killed as a result of these policies? Policies in which, remember, Saddam Hussein was himself a full participant. But it's the outcome. We did it. Saddam did it. It's the outcome that we're interested in. What would you do? Well, one way to do it would be to say, well, let's just take the death rate, infant mortality rate in 1990, and then compare that with what happened afterwards. But that's really not exactly fair. For example, demographers looking at what happened in the famine in China between 1958 and 1961 don't do that. They look at what were the trends in Chinese demography before the disaster, then make uh, this assumption. It's reasonable to say that in the absence of these political events that we're analyzing, those trends would have continued. And then you compare the two. In other words, you do this. You do what's called an excess mortality study. And what demographers do is they take, this is the, these are the trends, this is what was happening in Iraqi infant mortality down to this point. This is what would likely have continued to happen. Then you have data about what actually happened, and then you do the <laughs> integral underneath between these two curves. This is what you look at. How many people are we talking about? Lots of studies were done about this, some better, some worse. The best one, by most accounts, that is also rather conservative, in its estimates deliberately conservative, done by a man named Richard Garfield, who's a professor of public health at the Columbia University Medical School, gives this. Somewhere between 300,000 and half a million Iraqi children died as a result of these policies. Now, you don't normally find information like this out there in the press, now do you? You haven't seen very much about this. It happened. And just because we don't know it, doesn't mean other folks don't know it. Remember, Truman is right. There is nothing new under the sun except for the history that we don't know. Here's what Richard Garfield, shown there, had to say. Sustained increases in child mortality are extremely rare in the 20th and 21st century. Okay? Very, very rare. This is almost unknown. It's a loss of several decades of progress. Hmm. What did we have to say about this? Now, at the time, there were a lot of people screaming about this. A lot of people were protesting. And they asked the American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, what she thought, and this is what she said. On 60 Minutes. She said, 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes is widely available on the net. You can watch 60 Minutes. You can get this information. Okay? And this is what she had to say. Well, there's an old Greek myth about sowing the dragon's teeth, where you go out and kill the dragon, and then you use them as seeds, and then they sprout up soldiers that come back at you. Here's a quote about someone who was paying attention. We may not have been paying attention, but other people were, like this guy. This is what Osama bin Laden had to say in 1998, three years before 2000, before 9/11. He was ranting on all kinds of outlets about what was going on in Iraq. Now, Osama bin Laden is a crazed utopian fanatic, in my opinion. But nevertheless, in terms of trying to generate an appeal to remember huge numbers of young people who for the first time are getting some kind of education, 
Oh, what do you think? You think people might listen to a, to a crazy guy like this? Could be. It's a problem. So, in the aftermath, we still it still hasn't been fixed for reasons of instability in Iraq, uh, which we'll talk about later when we go through the modern history of Iraq in detail. So, mortality falls, but you can get reversals. Fertility falls can also be reversed. Here's the United States. This is where guys like me came from, right? Fertility fell, and then there's the post-war baby boom, right? And the fertility rate went back up, but then plunged again. But these are both relatively rare. Age structures. Big increase in the proportion of population that's young. The longer this acceleration lasts, the larger the percentage of youth. Lots of young people. Right? Notice the difference between the way the United States looks. Okay? Here are young people, a relatively much smaller percentage of the population than in these countries like Egypt okay, and Algeria. Here's an age pyramid that says youngest people at the bottom as percentage of population. It's literally that. It's a pyramid in a place like Afghanistan or Palestine where you see this kind of very large number of young people. 50% okay? of all Palestinians, of all adult Palestinians are between the ages of 15 and 30. These kids are paying attention and they have ideas of their own. This proportion will last for at least two decades. This is not going to go away anytime soon. There is differential fertility between the Jewish population of mandatory Palestine and the Arab population, and it is in, and little by little, there is a shift in the percentage of population uh, that is Arab, and this is having all kinds of consequences. Now, a youth bulge that then slows down can also be good for you economically. This is called the demographic dividend by economic demographers, and Thailand is a good example. Basically, what happens is like this. Look, take a population and divide it into three pieces. Kids that are too young to work or are still in school. The working age population and the old folks. The third and the second group are dependent on the second group. Okay? The kids and the old people are dependent on the working age population for their support. The higher the percentage of the working age population, the lower that burden is. It's been shown in lots of economic studies that when you get this expansion, and you have good luck, and you have sensible and strong economic policies, this accelerates economic growth, which has been the case throughout East Asia. Thailand's case is shown here. Okay, so, demography. Now something else that we don't know. Let's look at another case about fertility falling quickly, a case study, to see how this happens. Let's look at Iran. This is a big deal. Iran is in the news all the time. We're constantly hearing about sanctions and riots and nukes and just all kinds of stuff. <coughs> what we don't hear about is that in the last generation, there has been a demographic revolution in this country. And if we would only be patient, this demographic revolution will pay off. Indeed, we can already see signs of it paying off. It just takes some time. What are the key features here? The Shah of Iran, who left, fled in 1979, he introduced family planning. This was reversed in the 1990s. You get an Islamic revolution. You get a big war. Wars are always bad for family planning because people somehow think that kids who are born will fight, imagining the war will go on for another 20 years, which it rarely does, but never mind. There's an ideological issue here okay, about the role of women. So if you think about it, your Amer basic American conception of you, you've got an Islamic Republic, you've got the Ayatollah Khomeini as its founder, and you wouldn't think that this would be the kind of country that would generate one of the two fastest falls in fertility in history, the other being the People's Republic of China. You wouldn't expect that. You wouldn't think that would necessarily happen because you would think, well, we know that fertility is really driven by things like women's education and health care. And, gee, how come these folks that are insisting on veils are also, how does this work? Let's think about this. There it is, but it did happen. It's one of the fastest falls in fertility, and it just goes to show 
Ideology is one thing. Official pronouncements are one thing. What goes on underneath on the ground is typically something else altogether. Here's what happened to total fertility rate in Iran. It fell through the floor. Notice here. These days, the total fertility rate in Iran is at least at replacement level, if not below it. In other words, the average Iranian woman, statistically average again, has no more children now than the average American woman. Interesting to note. Okay? This is a huge change. This, to put it mildly, was not the case 25 years ago when the average woman in Iran was having over six kids. This is a huge change. It shows it by year and shows its impact on demographic trends, fertility rate collapsing. Interestingly, this didn't just happen in the cities. It also happened in the rural areas. It also happened at every age. This shows the age-specific fertilities, but then their each graph shows it over at different time periods. The whole graph shifts down. Everybody starts, in other words, it isn't just the younger people. Everybody starts having fewer kids. And this has had all kinds of consequences. You had this typical looking global southern age structure in Iran then, but this is changing. It's changing. Iran is becoming more and more like, looking demographically like Europe, the United States, East Asia, as time goes on. How did this happen? Well, the big one is that women are no longer illiterate. Women went to school. Youth literacy has boomed. Nearly all Iranian youth now are literate. And even in the rural areas, what's happened to literacy? There's young girls right, in the rural areas. These are remote areas. They're difficult to get to. What's happened? Literacy rates now are nearly 90%. Well, how did this happen? It could only happen in one way. They got the girls into schools. So they had a huge campaign to expand education. They put girls in school. Boys are also in school. And today, it's the case that here is the ratio of women to men in universities and higher education. It's above, it's, it is actually above one. More, if you take the population of universities in Iran, there are more women than men in those universities. So. This is, again, not the sort of thing you're likely to get on Fox News. What's the percent reaching grade five? It's very high. Right? Uh, so Iran has done a huge job in pushing this. How did they do this? Not only did they have a push in the cities, but they also set up a system, founded at the time of the revolution, to spread literacy to disadvantaged groups. The people shown here are called Turkmen. They're a migratory group that live in northern Iran and various other places. There's a country across, across the northern border, Turkmenistan. Uh, and so they had to find ways to reach out to these people who actually speak a different language than the majority language of Farsi. They had to go in these rural areas. They're hard to reach these folks. It's hard to educate kids who are moving around all the time, but they did this. They set up adult literacy classes. And one of the mechanisms they used is something that lots of mass mobilization regimes have used throughout modern <coughs> history. That is, they used the military to do this. Now notice, I just used a phrase here, a mass mobilization regime. This was a revolutionary regime. Not a left-wing revolutionary regime. It is a bit different. But a revolutionary regime all the same, meaning it mobilized large numbers of people and then tried to use them to accomplish various ends that the state had set upon. One of these ends might be fighting the Iraqi army, but another end was to educate everybody in the country. Another thing that happened that brought down the fertility rate that's associated with this education is despite pronouncements by mullahs, the marriage age, okay, at first uh, went went down, but then it went up. Okay? The Islamist government lowered the legal age of marriage when they first took office to nine. But Iranians largely yawned and paid no attention. Okay? And so what happens, they paid no attention, and so what happens is uh, there's been an, an increase. Uh, that, that slide is the wrong title, increase. 
In, in, infant mortality goes down, death rates go down. So here you have replacement levels, basically dark blue. This is where most people in Iran live. This is a, is a huge, two huge deserts out here, and it's also the most backward and poorest part of the country. They have higher rates uh, of population growth and fertility, but in the poor areas of the country, there has been a political <coughs> revolution. So what? So what is already visible? If you want to understand the events of the last year in Iran, where you have all these kinds of demonstrations against an authoritarian regime that stole an election, who's doing a lot of the demonstrating? Newly educated young people. And if you look at the photographs, and we'll see some of them when we talk about it, large numbers of women also demonstrating. Now, this movement was defeated temporarily, but the smart money in the long run is, has got to be on forces like those, because in the long run, that's going to matter. There are reasons of political generations in Iran. Basically, the old generation that fought the war of the revolution, fought the war with Iraq, those guys have to believe that what they did was worth something. Otherwise, what was the point of all their sacrifices? But the good news is these folks over time get older, younger people rise, they begin to become more powerful, and we are very likely to see these changes. We will not see those changes if we in the United States say, oh, these folks are our enemies. Right? After all, when you bomb a country, you bomb everybody. Right? You bomb the young people as well as the older people. You bomb the educated young women as well as you know, street thug fanatics working for the regime. So when you go doing things like this, it's likely to make them very angry, and people always rally around the flag. So again, the counsel here is patience. Be patient, Americans. Wait. Time is actually on our side if we could just find the maturity to chill out. Given the <laughs> When I say the key is American political maturity, I have to tell you that on the eve of the weekend, this may not improve your weekend because, well, our track record on political maturity is somewhat questionable. Uh, so, but anyway, that's a way uh, to look at this. So what are the consequences all through the region? This youth bulge made huge challenges for the the kids themselves, their families, and for the governments. What were they? Job creation, housing, education, and the search for identity. If you get an increase in population growth, which we've seen happen in the immediate post war era, six years later, those kids, you need to enroll in school. Big problem. With a lag of about 15 years, which in international data is usually taken to be the beginning of working age, okay, there's a demand for jobs. And the employment challenge in this region is enormous. Let's just look at some simple calculations of how enormous. The Middle East and North Africa has the most rapidly growing labor force in the world. That's a problem. Think of it in simple supply and demand terms. You've got a supply function for labor and a demand function for labor. The supply function for labor is marching off to the left, to your right, very rapidly. Therefore, you've got to have the demand growing at the same time. You've got to create jobs. Because if you don't, one of two things or some combination will happen. Either the wage rate will go down and people become poorer, or the unemployment rate goes up. Neither one is very pleasant for anybody. So just to keep up with the numbers being added to the labor force, how fast do they have to create jobs? They have to create jobs four times faster than we do. And notice how well we're doing. You have noticed, actually. And eight times faster than the European Union. This is huge, right? This is a really daunting challenge, to put it mildly. No wonder there are large numbers of unemployed. No wonder they're annoyed. No wonder with all of these kids who are entering the labor force and can't find jobs, that alone, and it's not alone, there are many other things, but that alone is a recipe for social instability, no question. So let's look at this employment challenge. Just to keep up with these additions, they've got to create 100 million new jobs. 
doubling the current number of jobs. Good luck with that. Right? Every year, over 4 million new workers come looking for jobs. This is a policymaker's nightmare. Okay? I've listened to many, many stories in Egypt, in Jordan, in Morocco, in Tunisia, lots of places to government planners talking about this nightmare that they face all the time. All these kids, all the time, looking for jobs. Oh my God, how are we going to do this? We don't know. We're trying. What a mess. Okay. They talk about often nothing else. Okay. The increase in the labor force in the next two decades is likely to be equal to all the increase that happened in the second half of the 20th century. This scares policymakers to death. Now, the good news is that the rate of growth is slowing down a little bit because fertility rates have slowed down, and so with a lag, 15-year lag, you get a deceleration in addition to the labor force rate. So that's good, but it's still very high. This compares different major regions of the world. Here's the Middle East and North Africa. Notice it's great even now, come down a little bit, Faster even than Sub-Saharan Africa and way faster than Latin America, where unemployment is, as many of you know, a considerable problem. Much faster than East Asia and faster even than South Asia and India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. This scary little graph shows the numbers of new workers every year and notice how the number keeps going up. It gets scarier and scarier. What about unemployment? So we know the labor force is growing very fast. We know the number of jobs is unlikely to keep up with it, so we know there's going to be downward pressure on wages, and we also know that there's likely to be unemployment. Now, the trouble here with unemployment is no unemployment figures in the world are really accurate. Even in the United States, which collects them every week or every month, they have all kinds of issues, but at least in this country and in most rich countries, we have the resources to conduct systematic surveys every month. If you think about that, that's an expensive thing to do. It costs money, you have to have specialists, they have to be organized, they have to have data. It's expensive. Poor countries typically can't afford that, and they don't, and they don't do it. So unemployment figures outside in the global south are often guesses, estimates at a particular time, educated guesses, but they're there to be taken with several truckloads of salt. Still, here's the global unemployment rate's best guesses of this. Okay. Oh, one other thing about unemployment rates, as we'll see, governments like to minimize them, right? Because it doesn't look good if you say 25% uh, of our uh, unemployment rate, you don't look very good. So you sort of say, well, it's really about 15. Well, it's actually not more than 10. Right? But outsiders who may not care about what your government thinks, and who may have other concerns, who may be paid to gather information, who may have a lot of money, like the Central Intelligence Agency, may then go out and gather data and report them, and they may look rather different, as we'll see in a minute. Okay? So, here again, unemployment rates are high in the Middle East. Early and late 90s, they were very high. Here's an estimate from the World Bank, which, remember, has to, as a, as a UN agency officially, has to use national data although they pressured governments to change their data. Here's what the CIA has to say. Here's Yemen. One out of three Yemenis is unemployed. Hmm, could there be trouble in a country like that? What do you think? <laughs> and then you got, even in Saudi Arabia, unemployment rate of nearly 20%. Hmm, could there be instability lurking here? Look at Iraq. So these slides will all be online and on, on eRes, and you can look at these to see the kinds of high rates. Remember, we moan with some justification. Well, when unemployment rates in this region in California are 12%, we say, whoa, this is terrible. This is unacceptable, right? And it's true. It is terrible. It does look really bad. 12% well, folks is right down here. There are lots of countries that are at least that, if not higher, uh, throughout the region. Okay. And and, as you know, unemployment data are simply this kind of statistic. Total number of unemployed divided by the labor force. That's what gives you the unemployment rate, right? But total number of the employed of all ages. What about is unemployment concentrated among the young? Answer, yes, everywhere in the world. Why? Simple economics. Because they're new entrants and they don't have experience. And you know about this. 
It's hard to get your first job. It's hard to get your foot in the door. That's hard for you, and it's really hard for them in that part of the world. So, you un you unemployment amongst the youth, what are we talking about? In many cases, here's 50%, folks. In many cases in the world, you have unemployment among youth. Basically, one out of two of them can't get a job. Or if they do get a job, it's a job that they really don't like at all. Another source of political discontent. Okay. Unemployment tends to be concentrated among relatively educated and uh, uh, for various reasons. We'll go back over this. The need versus performance is bad. To create just 100 million new jobs in the next 10 years, 20% to reduce current unemployment and 80% just to keep up with the growth of the labor force. So, bottom line here is we have a quiet, unnoticed source of political instability that has nothing to do directly with oil, that has nothing to do directly with wars, that has nothing to do directly with anything except the great transformation itself. And in particular, this demographic component of the great transformation which has created this massive number of newly educated young people who are looking for solutions to their problems, both personal and economic and social and political, and trying to make sense out of the world, as any sensible young person always does. And all of this then, of course, then interacts with international politics, politics of the region, difficulties of state formation, probable conflicts over oil, but it's another independent element interacting with all of this other stuff, and that's what we need to understand. Now, today we give you back your first assignment. And what kind of rain will fall on the land that's dead and gone? When they start to ask us why And where are the keepers who let the whole thing dry Color will the leaves be a darker shade of brown Is this the kind of legacy to leave to the unborn What do we tell the children when they start to ask us why and where are the keepers who bled the whole thing dry? Keepers who bled the whole thing 